Right. Right. Glad you're doing well. You're looking good. Look like you're ready to have, have had plenty of food this Thanksgiving season, enjoyed it, and that kind of stuff. Hey, if you're uh, here for the first time this morning, I want you to know we're really glad you're here. It's an honor just to be able to be here with you and to connect with you and just to share God's word with you. So thank you for being here. Uh, we have learned, my wife and I, over the last little bit, that this is a really neat place. There's some good, good people here that just love Jesus and love each other. And so if you're visiting this morning, this is your first time here, uh, I want to encourage you, try making this home. Uh, there's a sign up the road that even talks about that. And I think you'll find it to be a place, it's just a really, really good place to grow your family and grow in Jesus and experience all he has for you. We're going to continue our little series we've been preaching the last few times we've been with you. Talk about pray like never before. And this morning, I want to encourage you before we dive into this part, just want to remind you of something. If you are considering praying and giving, and I don't know what I did with that. Uh, yeah, here it is. Hey, we mentioned a little bit ago our Lottie Moon Christmas offer. Maybe you're like, even what is Lottie Moon? Okay, there's a lot of people, our, your generation, and uh, especially younger ones, they're like, I don't even know what that is. That don't make sense to me. She was an amazing missionary that told people about Jesus all over the world. Just incredible. And so if you are praying and, and just have a way to give to that this year, I really want to encourage you to do that. I've been privileged to partner with missionaries around the world in ton, just tons of different countries. And these are people just like you and me that God calls to do extraordinary things in incredible places around the world. And how they get to do that is through people like you and me giving to this offering, and it supports them to do the missions that God's called them to. And then they are just loving on people, and some of them are in wonderful places. Some of them are in places <coughs> that you'd say, I'm going to pass. I'm not going there. And so for those people that are all over the world, they need our support. So I just want to encourage you to give and just pray and see what God would have you do. And just be intentional about that because it's one of those things that I promise you God's going to bless you in a really neat way as you support these guys. All right, that's mentioned about intentionality. In prayer, we're going to talk about that some more this morning, how we are intentional with our prayers and, and what we do with that. And a couple weeks ago when I was here with you, we shared that in our prayer strategy, the things that we're talking about, one of the ways that we can be intentional is how we praise God. You know, just giving him praise for who he is. We talked about a little bit about Thanksgiving and confession and how important it is to thank God for what he's doing in our life, but also that time of confession. And for many of us, we may see that that confession time needs to be about every five minutes. And other times it may be spread out a little bit more, but it seems like in my life, there seems to be something all the time that I'm needing to say, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, please, please get me right where I need to be with that. But then we move from that, talk about petition, uh, praying for the things we need, and then intercession on people's behalf and the things that we know that God is doing and how he's moving and working in. And so today we want to take that a little step further and we want to talk uh, some more about intentional being intentional in our prayer. But I want to ask you a couple of things as we, as we begin this. As guys, I'm going to speak specifically to those of us that are males, all right? There is something that I heard well over 20 years ago that has haunted me for all these years because I get to hear it a lot in my house when we heard after we've heard this. And it was a guy by the name of Bob Foy, him and his wife Phyllis, were leading a marriage conference at the church that I was serving at at the time. And in that time, he began sharing that men oftentimes get in their nothing box. Now, ladies, any of you ever noticed that us as guys have a nothing box? That we can just sit down, we can get somewhere, ain't nothing going on anywhere. It's like we've checked out, we're not even there. You can talk to us, you can ask us questions. We, you, you know, you may think we're here, we may think we're here, but really we don't. We're just in our nothing box, and we're chilling out, we're enjoying life. And I'm watching a lot of heads shake. You ladies like, mm -hmm. hey, that's the way it is. And guys, if we're honest, we'll have to admit, we've got a nothing box, okay? I guarantee you anybody over the age of 12 can say that their dad, the guys around them, have this innate ability to just sit down somewhere and go to nowhere, you know? And we can be content with that. We can enjoy every moment of that. But on the opposite end of that, most women don't have that ability, Okay? You don't hardly even have the ability to turn the switch off, much less know anything that's about being in a nothing box, you know? Penny oftentimes says to me, 
there's no way that you can be that blank. You know, you can be that out of it. And I'm like, I don't have a clue what you said. What was that you're talking about? You know, we just can't as guys, but for ladies, most of the time, you're constantly going. Your mind is thinking about 10 things down the road, and you, you, you're for sure that you told us 30 minutes ago about this thing, whether you did or not, we'll leave that up to debate when you get home. But anyway, you all the time got something going on as ladies. And so here's what I want to bring about with that and what I want you to think about. When we're talking about being intentional, oftentimes we need to be intentional in being still to hear what God wants us to hear. Now that can be easier in the being still part for us guys, but that don't mean that we hear what's going on, all right? But we need to learn as children of God to be still enough to hear what God's wanting to speak to us. You know, like Jeff, how do you know that? Why is that important? I want to share that with you in just a moment because in this teaching in this time of focus that we want to think about until you and I learn how to be still enough long enough to hear what God's wanting us to receive from him we're never going to get where it is he wants us to go and as we take off on our own journeys we're going to be going in places asking God to bless things to do things in us and through us that just possibly God never intended us to be on that road in the beginning, okay? And so it's so important that we learn what that is and how to be intentional with that. One of the reasons why that's so intentional is a verse in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 17. And this particular verse is the shortest verse in the Bible, basically, uh, it's one of the shortest verses anyway. It just says, pray without ceasing, okay? Pray without ceasing. Now, when we think about pray without ceasing, all of us automatically, when we hear that word, would say, there's no way that I can do that. There's no way that I can constantly be praying because I just don't know how to pay attention that long. I don't know how to stay focused that long. I don't know what I would pray about that long if I'm praying without ceasing. So how does all that unfold? What does God want us to understand about that? We'll gather some of those thoughts as we go through our time together this morning. But when we think about praying without ceasing, there's three things that if you're taking notes or got a way to remember these five things, stick them on your phone, on your uh, outline, on the bulletin that you got this morning as you came in, as you picked up. One, I want you to remember this. Prayer influences people, Okay. Prayer influences people. You and I have this innate ability to believe, I guess it is, or some kind of way we get it, that we have this crazy ability to impact people. And, and we do to a degree, but nothing like prayer can impact people. Because when we pray and we're asking God to do some incredible things and we're trusting him, God does way more than we could ever possibly imagine could happen in our life. So prayer influences people. Another thing that prayer does, though, is prayer affects circumstances. Prayer affects what's going on around us. Prayer affects the relationships in our families, in our marriages, in our workplace. Prayer affects people that are far from Jesus. And the third thing I want to mention to you is that prayer impacts eternity. So all three of these things are so vital for how God's kids lead their life. This past Tuesday, I had a guy say, Jeff, I want to walk out with you. I want to, I've got a question I want to ask you. And as we walked out, he began sharing with me that his father-in-law was just this amazing guy, 80 years old, a wonderful guy, very moral fella, but he's also a gentleman that does not know Jesus. He's very intellectual, very science-driven, and he just really does not have a desire and never has exhibited or showed any desire to have much conversation about Jesus and the things of faith and that kind of stuff. And he said, how can I begin to, to share with him? What are some things I might be able to do with that? 
And so as we talk, I just shared a few things for him to maybe begin praying about and, and then just see what happens over Thanksgiving as he's spending that time with his father-in-law. And one of the things I said is just, just ask him why. You know, don't challenge him necessarily, but just say, why is it that faith? Why is it that Jesus is something that's a struggle for you to even consider the reality of and what he might want to do in your life? What, what's keeping you from doing that? And allow him to process that. After all, he's a guy that's very smart. Said so another thing you might be able to do is give you some resources of some people that are just like him that have written some amazing books uh, that might be able to challenge him. On Friday, I get a text from this guy. And he said, Jeff, it's amazing how open my father-in-law has been over Thanksgiving to this conversation. See, sometimes when we're just intentional and we pray and we put the right things in front of the people that we're praying for, God begins to do something amazing in our life. Why is that important? Because prayer impacts eternity. That is one of the things that you and I need to wrap our heads around and be sure that whether it's when we're slipping away into our nothing box or we're so busy doing so many things we don't get anything done, that we're remembering that God wants to do something remarkable through prayer. I want us to jump down this morning and spend a little bit of time with Jesus and what he did right before he was going to be crucified. Because it's a time of prayer that's modeled, it's shown in the Bible, that Jesus walked through with his disciples, that teaches me, and I hopefully can teach you as well this morning, that there's some really powerful things that if Jesus needed to do this, it's probably wise that old Jeff right here does the same thing. This section of scripture is going to be found in Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to read it to you, then I'll pull out some key points of prayer that I want to encourage you with this morning as well. Then, accompanied by his disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There, he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. We walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and he prayed. And this is what he said. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him, and he prayed more fervently. And as he was in such agony of spirit that the sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last, he stood up again and returned to his disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Jesus said, why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. There are some incredible things, in fact, actually eight different things I want to point out in this section of scripture right here that Jesus just flat out lays out that helps me every single day and I believe will help you as well as you become intentional about your prayer. The first thing I think is important to see that, that Jesus did, that as Jesus left the upper room, it says he went to the Mount of Olives as usual, okay? Jesus had a routine. And so that's the first thing is this, have a routine and a place, you know? If Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world that died on the cross for you and me, if it was important for him to go to a place like usual and spend time praying to his Father, learning the will of God and soaking that in and submitting to that, surely that's applicable to me and you as well this morning. <clears throat> so what's a, what's a good routine for you? What's a place that may fit. And maybe you're like, well, I'm a morning person, so if I get up in the morning, that'll be a great time to pray. Go for it. But listen, for those of you that are nighttime people, that's probably not going to be your best fit. Okay? It might work well if you can get discipline enough to build that routine in, but if you're a nighttime owl and you can't hardly even communicate in the morning until you had 10 cups of coffee and that kind of thing, maybe the morning's not the best time, but that late night, when everybody's in bed and you're wide open, you're ready to go a little bit longer, maybe that's the time that you get in your special place and spend time with Jesus. After all, Jesus withdrew and did that with his father so that he would know what God wanted him to be about. <clears throat> the second thing I see in this is that prayer that you don't give in to temptations, what Jesus was saying to him. 
It said, pray that you will not give in to temptation. So when you're intentional about your prayer, Jesus was telling his disciples, remember, this was the guys that had spent every waking moment almost for three years with Jesus. He's saying, guys, you need to be sure you're praying not to give in to temptation. So if the disciples that spent all the time with Jesus needed to pray not to give in to temptation, I'm sure that I need to do the same thing. So if we can begin in our routine, in our prayer, as we're intentionally praying to say, God, I'm here in my place, just me, and it's quiet. Maybe you got some worship music on, you got the word open, you're reading just a little bit of scripture, and you're praying, you say, Lord, I want to ask you first and foremost, help me not to give in to temptation. Because listen, when we're praying, that's going to be one of the times, the strongest times that there's going to be all kind of temptation come your way. Your thought life as you get disciplined in prayer is going to go all over the place because Satan can't stand for God's kids to pray. And we're going to be constantly disrupted with those kind of things. So we need to be sure that we're saying, Lord, help us not give in to temptation. And then another thing, that Jesus modeled right through here is this. It says, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. <clears throat> Here's the third thing I want to challenge us with. Expect things to be harder than you desire. Okay? Expect things to be harder than you desire. A few years back, probably about 12, 13 years ago now, somewhere around that time frame, I had the privilege to be in India. And like I said, I, I've been, been a lot of places in the world. But this particular time, was there with a great friend of mine. We were roommates from seminary, and our families have been real close over the years. And uh, Chris has been he's been the international international mission board missionary that like we're talking about here this morning for years. And we were in India. And we were in an area in India called Varanasi. And if you know much about India, and I didn't know anything about it when I got there at that time. Varanasi is the birthplace of Hinduism, and that particular area of India. For me, at that time, was one of the darkest places I'd ever placed myself in in all my life. I would love to describe some of the things that I saw and experienced while we were there during that time. I'm not going to do that because with some of the age of some of the kids we've got in the room this morning, I just don't think that would be wise. But let me just simply say this. It was awful. The way that Humanity was treated, and the things that I had deserved during that time were amazing. I mean, it absolutely blew me away at the, the evil, the, the spiritual darkness that was there, the hollowness that you would look into people's faces and eyes. You just knew that there was no presence of God. You could, you could just sense it everywhere you moved around. And one night during the middle of the night, Something happened to me that night that I'd never had happen before and praise the Lord, have never had happened to me since. But I began to encounter a spiritual attack unlike anything I had ever experienced in my life. It was absolutely brutal. And when I woke up and this was going on, guys, I literally felt like I could not breathe. It was no different than putting an elephant almost on my chest. It was crazy. And as I began wrestling with what was going on, it, I quickly realized that this was a spiritual battle. And all I could understand in that time was that Satan wanted to absolutely kill me that night. And I, I was, I was, I mean, I, I really didn't know what to say or what to think. It took me a few minutes to like, like, God, how do I need to move? What do I need to say? How do I need to, to wrestle with this? Because the spiritual darkness in that area of the world is so intense. You see, Jesus, when the scripture talks about him praying and, and praying so intently and so hard that the sweat was dropping like drops of blood, I believe Jesus was facing way, way, way darker and greater things than I was even in that moment. But what that moment taught me was that even those of us that call out on the name of Jesus... And we're doing what Jesus wants us to do. We're going to take spiritual attacks sometimes. And sometimes they can be incredibly challenging and difficult. That night as I began to go to battle, and I will call it battle because it was one of those times where all I knew to do was pray, call out the name of Jesus, quote scripture, and trust God for who he was. 
Also, in the middle of the night, there was two guys in this world that I knew that I could trust. With it. No, actually, there's three of them. And I sent them texts from India that night and said, guys, I need you praying for me right now. And those guys began to pray. And I know they did because we talked about it later when I got back. And I asked people to begin interceding on my behalf. Remember one of the things I talked about intercession? There's need for that in desperate situations in all of our lives, oftentimes. And I've never been so glad to see the morning sun rise in all my life. Because not long before the sun rose, <clears throat> I got this really clear just word from the Lord. Jeff, don't forget, no matter how dark this moment is, I'm greater. And I share a little bit of that story with you just to remind you. No matter how dark your moment may be right now, God's greater. And his joy is amazing. His healing is powerful. And the things he does in our life to bring us through the darkest moments that we may have are absolutely incredible. So as you trust Jesus and as you pray and as you come across those moments, just know, don't give in, don't give up because as a child of God, all Satan can do is make you miserable as all get out. He cannot do anything other than that because you're secured in the hand of God. And when you're trusting Jesus, Jesus is going to walk you through. But we've got to be sure that we're keeping our eyes set right on where Jesus wants us to be. That's not saying that everything's going to work out perfectly the way we desire it to all the time. After all, what did Jesus say to his father here just a couple minutes ago when I was reading this to you? Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. What happened? God looked at his son and said, son, I can't do that cannot do that because there's too many people that need me and the only way for that to happen is for you to die on a cross for me Amen. and that's what Jesus did so we need to expect things to be harder than you even desire another thing that stands out in this section of scripture is this we need to seek God's will over everything remember Jesus said yet I want your will to be done not mine Jesus said God I don't want this I, I mean, literally, that's what he said. If you can take this away, Lord, please do so. But then in the next breath, he says, but I don't want my will. I want your will to be done. So as children of God, we've got to be sure that in our prayer time, as we're focused where God wants us to be, that we're seeking God's will over everything. And as we're seeking God's will over everything, in those moments, God's going to show up and he's going to show out and all oh my the things that happen for his glory are amazing. Sometimes it may hurt. Sometimes the things we walk through are painful. Amen. But because of God's heartbeat, because of what God wants to do in the lives of us and his children, and even those who do not know Jesus, we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but specifically because of what God wants to do in the life of those who don't know Jesus, God's going to do something incredible in our lives as we talk with him and listen to him and then as we follow him and we obey what God wants us to do. So seek God's will over everything. A fifth thing that Jesus shows us in this section of scripture is that fervent prayer is agonizing. Can you imagine praying so hard that your prayer life produces, like it said, and Jesus is here, that your sweat looks like drops of blood. And Jesus was going to battle. Jesus knew what that was and Jesus teaches us that we can be about doing the same kind of things as we seek God's heart. So fervent prayer is agonizing. It's not just getting on our knees or getting in a prayer closet and saying, Lord, this has been a tough day. I hope you'll take care of this. I'll talk to you tomorrow. It's getting very serious on our knees before the Lord and getting very serious in that prayer closet and agonizing with the Lord about what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, the pain that we have or the concern we have for somebody that's lost, that don't know Jesus. And the more we agonize with the Father about somebody that don't know Jesus, the softer those people's hearts begin to be. And as those hearts begin to be softer, it may just simply be that a little child crawls up on their granddaddy's lap and says, I love you, and Jesus does too. And all of a sudden, that grandpa turned his life over to Jesus. God, you don't ever know. All because of prayer, God does incredible things. A fervent prayer is agonizing another thing that we see out of this section of scripture 
is that we will experience times of failure. Okay? We're going to experience times of failure. Say, Jeff, how do you know that? Look at the disciples, the guys that are closest to Jesus, what they do. They sat down on the ground and went to sleep. Okay? They just literally went to sleep when Jesus told him, guys, you've got to be praying. You've got to be spending this time you need to do so you won't give in to temptation. But instead of doing that, the guys is like, mm, this is really hard. I think I'm going to take me a nap. Okay? And that's what happened. What do you and I do? I'll be honest. There's lots of times I fall asleep praying. And I wake up sometimes and it's been the most glorious thing because it's okay to fall asleep praying. And then there's other times I'm like, oh my goodness. This is what I was talking about with the Lord and in the middle of it, I fell asleep. See, it takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of focus on our part. But prayer can be agonizing, but in the middle of all that, we're going to experience times of failure. <clears throat> but a thing that's so encouraging is Jesus found his disciples like this several times. And what did he do? He said, you bunch of knuckleheads, get out of here. I don't even want to talk to you anymore. Is that what he did? No. He said, guys, wake up. There's great things that need to be done. Just keep praying. Keep praying so you won't step into temptation. He encouraged them along the way. So even when we fail, guys, just know Jesus loves you. He's got a great plan. Another thing that I think Jesus shows us models in this is don't give up, but understand you're going to be tempted. And then the last thing is this. Sometimes just be quiet and listen. Prayer is not just simply about getting to the spot where we sit down and we're just praying. And that's a big part of it. But a bigger part of prayer is listening. Now, for those of us that are guys, for me, that's one of the things that I know a little bit about. I don't know a lot about a lot, but I do know this, is I understand all the time that I don't listen very well. Okay? I hear that sometimes. Honey, did you not listen to me? And I have to say, no, I'm sorry, I didn't. Or sometimes when I really want to be challenging about it, yeah, I heard you. This is what you said. And, and was that what it was said? No, not at all. You know? But sometimes we just need to be sure that we're still enough and quiet enough to listen to the Spirit of God. One of the great things about who God is is that when Jesus left this earth and he returned and was ministering there for a while with his disciples before he was, um, you know, went, on, went on to heaven for good. Told us that he was going to send us a comforter, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would be with us forever and forever and forever. And the Holy Spirit is, lives inside of us. And so as you pray, just know the Holy Spirit's working inside of you, doing remarkable things. So, if this is who Jesus says we need to be, the kind of kids we need to grow up and be, the type of action we need to have, why in the world is this so hard? There's several different things I want to point out to you about why it's so hard. <clears throat> the first one's this. I want you to listen to the scripture in Isaiah chapter 57. It says the high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this. I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. One of the main reasons that you and I struggle a lot of times with this, and I at least say I do, is pride. Okay? It's pride. We want to do what we want to do. And God has a different way. So just check the pride. As you pray, say, Lord, help me be the humble child that you want me to be. I submit my pride to you. Do what you need to do with it. A second thing that I think is a good reason why we don't see the things happening in prayer that we should is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Listen to this. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Just simply our unbelief. Sometimes our unbelief 
keeps us from doing the things that God wants to do in our life. One of the things that I saw so clearly in that episode that happened to me in India was the thing that I was sure of was God. I wasn't sure of anything else that night. I didn't know how things would go. I didn't know if, I literally didn't know anything. But I knew this, that the God that I serve, the God that saved me as an eight-year-old boy, would do what he needed to do for his glory. My belief was great that night. I wish I could say every single day of my life my belief was that strong, but that night my belief was great. And that's one of the things that keeps us from experiencing the things that God wants us to in prayer, sometimes our unbelief. So our pride and our unbelief. The third thing sometimes is this, though. It's in Luke chapter 11, verse number 1. Where said, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Sometimes just our simply not knowing our ignorance keeps us from praying the way God wants us to pray. Keeps us from experiencing the mighty movement of God in the way that God wants to move because his kids won't get on their face before him the way that he wants us to. We just don't do it. And then third, fourthly, it's time. In Mark chapter 14, it says this, <laughs> the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you would say this morning, you know what? More than anything, I'm so busy, I don't even know which way I'm going. Yeah, you ever feel like that? That some weeks you are just so busy, you, you barely remember that you need to get out and get to church on a Sunday morning. So busy that you go through the whole week and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even pick up my Bible one time this week to read any scripture. Or we're so busy that we get through the week and like, man, I didn't really pray anything any time this week. Just simply because of time. We don't have it built in. We don't have it structured in. So as we think about all this and we, we wrap all this up, I want to share with you just a few things and then we're going to close with this. In John chapter 17, I'm not going to read all the scriptures because it, we'd be here too long, okay? But in John chapter 17, a lot of times this is called the high priestly prayer. It's an amazing prayer that you can read through. But there's several things that Jesus does that I want us to catch because after all, the scripture teaches us that we're to be imitators of him. And so more than what Jesus said, I want us to focus on what Jesus did because when Jesus did something, oh my, even when he said something, but when Jesus does something, it really teaches us some powerful things. First of all, Jesus prayed for himself, okay? Even the son of God, Prayed for himself. In verse number five, he said, Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Jesus went to the Father and prayed. Another thing that Jesus prayed, he prayed for his pre uh, present followers. Jesus prayed for those that already knew him, that had placed their faith and their trust in him. <clears throat> and so maybe this morning it'll be good for you to pray for somebody beside you that knows Jesus. And just intercede on their behalf and Pray for others. We see that all throughout what Jesus was praying here. Another thing that Jesus did is Jesus prayed for future believers. Listen to what it says down in verse number 20. I pray not only for these, but for those, but for also for those who believe in me through their word. I love that verse of scripture and all down through because it tells us a whole lot about what you and I are to be about. Pray not only for those, but also for those who believe in me through the word. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. You see, there's a lot of people that need to be believers in Jesus. There's a lot of people that they want to know who Jesus is. There's a lot of people that are just searching and you know what I found with searching people? They're looking for answers. Sometimes they don't even know what they're looking for, but they're searching. You and I were like that one day. We were searching. And guess what we found? We found that Jesus loves us. We found that if we place our trust and our faith in him, that he would change our life and radically change us. That's the God that we serve. And so as a result, now there are many people who are still waiting to come to a relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to ask you and invite you to do something. 
We are entering into a season that is unlike any other, Christmas. Hopefully you love Christmas, you know? Now for some people, Christmas is, is a struggle because of all the things that's happened around their family and their life. But most of us, we love Christmas. One of the things about Christmas that's so amazing to me is that lots and lots and lots of people who you would invite to come to church with you on a Sunday morning that would never, ever, ever consider coming to church, guess what they would do around Christmas time? They'd come. They would. There's just something about the world celebrating the birth of our Savior that filters, fills up in people's hearts and they become more curious and they become more willing. Their heart softens a little bit and they're willing to hear. And so what I want to encourage you to do as you pray like never before is to pick out one or two people or one or two families that you say, Lord, I know this family doesn't go to church. I know they're not connected with you. I know they're not following you. And I'm not asking you to do that in a judgmental way. It's just the proof in the pudding, so to speak. You know, we know that they don't. And that's okay that they're where they are because our God loves them anyway. And our God wants to change their life. So if you and I would be willing to pray like never before for just a little bit of time and intercede on their behalf, and then maybe, just maybe, consider giving a small invite to come to church with you. See, most people that will come to church around Christmas, they're going to come on December 18th. That's the Sunday before Christmas. December 25th being Christmas is an amazing morning, but let's be honest. Most lost people are going to be around the Christmas tree opening up their gifts, okay, instead of coming to church on Christmas morning. That's just the reality. But the 18th is a different story. So here's what I want to invite you to do as we wrap this message up this morning. Focus in on one or two people, one or two families. Pray for the next couple weeks. Say, God, soften their heart. God, prepare my heart. God, give me boldness. God, give me clarity on who I'm supposed to invite. God, give me a passion for somebody that don't know you. Lord, burden my heart for somebody in my class at school, somebody I play ball with, somebody I work with that don't know you. And Lord, grow my love for them in such a way that you'll create such a boldness inside of me that sometime the week after next, I'll invite them to come to church with me on Sunday morning. Maybe be willing to invest just a little bit more and say, all right, I'm setting aside 50 bucks and I'm going to take them to lunch after church. And we can just talk about what we heard. Not in a way like, wow, what did you think about the message this morning? No, just casually have a conversation about Jesus. Because here's what I want to share with you, commit to you with all. On the 18th, if you'll bring some people, I'll sure tell them about Jesus. It's Christmas. Fervent prayer changes things. Fervent prayer intersects where people are and changes lives. You've seen it. Many of you have experienced it. My desire is to see people come to know Jesus. My desire is to see those of us that are God's kids get on so, such a fire, such a passion for people that are far away from God that we can't help but build a relationship with them and talk with them, to them about him. Would you take that up? Would you consider that? If you don't make it, that's okay. Okay? God's going to keep growing. God's going to keep maturing us. God's going to keep doing a lot of things in our life. But for those of us that can do that, partner with somebody else. Watch what happens. Pray like never before. You see, Jesus modeled this in so many ways that we've looked at the last little bit. Let's take him at his word. As his kids, be faithful in it and see what happens. Maybe there's one thing that's standing in the way of that. Maybe that's you. Maybe there's something inside your heart. Maybe there's some sin that may be there. Maybe it's some unconfessed sin or something that you don't want anybody else to know. And that's okay. You don't have to tell me or anybody else in this room that won't share a secret with you. God already knows. So come clean. Just let him know. Confess it to him. Say, God... 
This is what's going on in my life. Will you clean me up? Set me on a path that allows me to do what it is you want me to do for your glory, for your fame, so that people come to know Jesus and my family and my friends and my school. I just want to be used by you. Would you be willing to do that? Pray with me. God, I thank you this morning for the hope that we have in Jesus. And Lord, when we consider what it is to pray fervently, to pray like never before, one of the things that always stands out in my heart, in my mind, in my life, is the fact that eternity depends upon it for so many people. And Lord, while we can't save anyone, you sure do give us this amazing privilege to be a part of your story in their life. And so Lord, for the people that need to know Jesus around us, prepare us to be a part of their story. Lord, if we need to be cleaned up this morning, if we need to be washed completely free from sin for the very first time and we accept you in our life, Lord, reveal it to show us through your spirit what's needed in our life. But Lord, eternity depends upon this for so many people and as your children, we just want to submit to you this morning. And Lord, we want to say thank you for what you're going to do because God, we know that the need is great. There's so many people just ready if the invitation is extended. So Lord, use us for your glory. Do in us whatever you have to do so you can do through us what you want to do for your glory. And Lord, we thank you. We praise you for what you're going to do. And God, I want to thank you now for friends and family, neighbors, co-workers, classmates at school, teammates on the ball field and in the gym, people that are in dance with, our, with us, people that just hang out together that are far away from you, but yet they need you so desperately. Lord, I want to thank you now for people that are coming, going to come to know Jesus over this Christmas season. God, use this body of believers to stir this community in such a way that it's undeniable that Jesus has shown up. Lord, may your kids, your children, be fervent in our prayers so that we're ready for what it is you want us to ask us to do. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would, let's stand. We're going to sing. If you need to talk to somebody, I'll be right down here. Definitely do business with the Lord and whatever He wants you to do.